John chapter 17. And uh, we uh, got in down through the first five verses. So we're going to pick up in verse 6 tonight, but start reading in verse 5. Uh, These words spake Jesus, and lifted up his eyes to heaven, and said, Father, the hour is come. Glorify thy Son, that thy Son also may glorify thee. As thou hast given him power over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as thou hast given him. And this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. I have glorified thee on the earth. I have finished the work which thou gavest me. And now, O Father, glorify thou me with thine own self, with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. I have manifested thy name unto the men which thou gavest me, out of the world, thine, and they were, thine they were, and thou gavest them me, and they have kept thy word. Now, when we start in verse 6, we're starting the next section of the prayer. The first five verses, he prays for himself, his work, doing the Father's work. And, And again, when he's praying there about himself, he's not... I'm doing this on my own effort. I'm doing this according to your will, Father, your word, your work. Then in verse 6 down to verse 19, he's going to pray for his disciples, specifically the apostles, but as they represent the, the totality of the little flock. Okay, here He's talking to the disciples, so he's going to be praying for them. And then in verse 20 down to verse 26, He's going to pray for the future disciples that will join the little flock after he goes to heaven. He's on exile as they go out in the new covenant ministry and in the book of Acts and on into the tribulation. So he's going to pray for that future group. So the first five verses, he's praying for himself and the work that he's been doing, the Father's work and everything. And then 6 to 19, a bulk of it, he's going to pray for actually the little flock here, the the 12 apostles, and then he's going to pray for the future group. In verse 5, he's finished the work out of verse 4. He's given them the word. He's identified the the little flock. He's identified the, the leadership. Then he says, glorify, and now, O Father, glorify thou me with thine own self, with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. So again, the Christ, nothing of himself. He's receiving the glory. And the way he says it, with he's receiving the glory from the Father, but how he says it in verse 5, with thine own self, with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. Glorify me, Father, with your glory, with the glory that I had back there in eternity past. And and again, he's reaching backwards down in verse 24. He says, Father, I will that they also whom thou hast given me be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory, which thou hast given me. For thou lovest me before the foundation of the world." There, he's looking toward the future, but yet where does he go back to? Back to eternity past. And he, he's going backwards before the world was. This becomes a statement about his deity. And, and I think this is kind of where we left off last time. Flip back to Isaiah 42. And I, tonight we're going to... We're only going to get down through verse 6, 7, and 8 because there's some things in here that you got to catch, and they're going to be kind of some of the minutial details in that's going on. One of them is in verse 5 here, which I had with thee before the world was, and this statement that he's making about his deity. Isaiah 42, and look at verse number 8. I am the Lord... That is my name, and my glory will I not give to another, neither my praise to graven images. 
<clears throat> before the former things are come to pass, and new things do I declare, before they spring forth, I tell you of them. Verse 8, I'm not going to give my glory to anyone else. If you come over to chapter 48 of Isaiah, and verse 11, For mine own sake, even for my own sake will I do it. For how should my name be polluted? And I will not give my glory unto another. Yet in John 17, what does the Father do? He gives His glory to who? To the Son. So the only way that He can do John... Go back to John 17. The only way He can do John 17 is if the Lord, if the Son, is equal to the Father. So the Son is equal in glory to the Father. There's a oneness, an equality. So in John 17, 5, on your way back there, stop in chapter 1. He, that, that's a clear statement about, hey, the Father said, the Lord said, the Father back there in Isaiah, I'm not going to give my glory to anyone. And then he says, Father, give me the glory that we had back there together in eternity past. The only way he can do that is if they're of equal, of equals. John chapter 1 Verse 26, we've seen this all through uh, John. John answered them, saying, I baptize with water, but there standeth one among you whom ye know not. He it is who cometh after me is preferred before me. Whose shoes latch it, I am not worthy to unloose. What's John say? He came after me, but he was really before me. Verse 30. This is he of whom I said, After me cometh a man which is preferred before me, for he was before me. Now, John the Baptist knows who he's talking about. The Father has revealed that to him. But John the Baptist also knows, Luke 1, that he's six months older than his cousin Jesus. But yet, who is Jesus? He's God. He's a Messiah. He's back over here. Verse 33. And I knew him not, but he that sent me to baptize with water, the same said unto me, Upon whom thou see the Spirit descending and remaining on him, the same as he which baptized with the Holy Ghost. And I saw him bear record that this is the Son of God. He understood because the Father told him that, hey, that's the Messiah. Even though he was born six months later, he was still what? Before me. If you come over to John 8. This is where it gets the Lord in some trouble with the Pharisees and the leaders. John 8, 58. Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, before Abraham was, I am. Uh-oh. He was there before Abraham. He, 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 he is deity. And they had a hard time understanding that statement, and he got him in trouble. So when you come back here to 17, 5, before we move out of this first section, I just wanted you to, the last thing he says about himself and really about the Father and about him doing the will of the Father is that he's able to continue doing what the Father needs him to do because of who he is. He's deity. Now, verse 6 I have manifest thy name unto the men which thou gave. And now he's going to move to the men, the twelve apostles specifically. Verse 7, Now they know that all things whatsoever thou hast given me are of thee. Well, let's read 6 again. I have manifest thy name unto the men which thou hast given me, which thou gavest me out of the world. Thine they were, and thou gavest them me, and they have kept thy word. Now they have known that all things whatsoever thou hast given me are of thee. For I have given unto them the words which thou gavest me, and they have received them, and have known surely that I come out from thee, and they have believed that thou didst send me. I pray for them. I pray not for the world, but for them which thou hast given me, for they are thine." Again, he's going to do what? He's praying for the, the men, the disciples. So back up in verse 6, 
I have manifest thy name unto the men which thou hast given me out of the world. Thine they were, and thou gavest them me, and they have kept thy word. He's manifesting thy name. Father, I've manifested thy name. He, he's going to identify who they are down in verse 12. While I was with them in the world, I kept them in thy name. Those that thou gavest me I have kept, and none of them is lost but the son of perdition. That the scripture. So he's identifying them as the twelve. These is who they are. But then he says, I manifest thy name. Drop down to verse 26. How, the, see, the thing is, is how did he manifest the Father's name? How did he do it? Verse 26, and I have declared unto them thy name, and will declare it, that the love wherewith thou hast loved me may be in them, and I in them. He manifested his name through preaching it, declaring it, making it known. If you drop back, if you run your eye back up there to verse 8, for I have given unto them the words which thou gavest me, and they have received them, and have known surely that I come out from thee, and they have believed that thou didst send me. You see how verse 8 starts with a four? Here's the explanation of how verse 6 and 7 takes place. Verse 6, I've manifested thy name. Verse 7, now they have known that all things whatsoever thou hast given me are of thee. I've come along, I've manifested, I've, I've <clears throat> I declared who you were, verse number 6, and they have kept thy word. I manifested to them your word and your works. I've given to I, I've I've declared God's I've declared your word to them. If you come back to chapter one again in verse fourteen, what is he? He's the word, and the word and the word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. I, Jesus Christ is the manifestation of the Word. Verse 18, chapter 1, verse 18. Am I going too fast? Okay. I, last night down in Queen Creek, had to catch myself because we, we were just flowing and they're like, oh, and it's like they're wind in the air, you know. <laughs> head, head sticking out, it was just real, it was like, whoa, okay, slow down. <laughs> It's amazing what happens when you get sleep, you know, you just, oh, let's go, you know. <laughs> Verse 18, no man has seen God at any time, the only begotten of the Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, he hath declared him. Chapter 1, verse 18 there. Christ is manifesting the Father to the men, to the twelve in a picture to really to the whole of the little flock. He's manifesting him. Now, run over to Hebrews chapter 2. Hebrews chapter 2, because kind of get it, we're going to get mired into some of the details here, but you, you got to, they're important. Hebrews 2 verse 11, on this issue of manifestate, manifesting and declaring him. Hebrews 2.11, For both he that sanctify and they who are sanctified are all of one, for which cause he is not ashamed to call them brethren, saying, I will declare thy name unto my brethren. In the midst of the church will I sing praise unto thee. Now that's a quote out of Psalms 22.22. And by the way, a little help, Psalms 22, 22, he says, he uses the word congregation. The Hebrew, the writer of Hebrews uses the word church. Guess what a congregation is? A church. What's a church? A congregation. <laughs> okay. So he quotes Psalms 22, 22 here, and he says what? I will declare thy name among who? The brethren. Now verse 13, and again, I will put my trust in him. And again, behold, I and the children which God hath given me. So now that's what we talked about last time. Me and the children back there out of Isaiah 8. 
So when you come to John 17, and he's in verse 6 here, I have manifest thy name unto the men which thou gavest me out of the world. I manifest, I'm talking to the men here that you gave me. And again, seven times thou hast given me, and so forth. Specifically to the apostles, he's got the little flock in view. And he says, you gave them to me, and I've been declaring your name to them. I've been declaring your word to them. Come over to Luke 12. The the men, they represent that larger group. Luke 12 and verse 32, he says, Fear not, little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. That The men here, the, the 12, they represent the larger group coming. Paul in 1 Corinthians 15, he says that he was seen above 500 brethren. So that's a little bit bigger group. So at this time, by the way, that helps you understand that in John 17, we're going to go into garden in 18, we're going to go to cross in 19. How many people, and sometimes people go, well, how many were little, of the little flock were there? Well, Paul helps you identify about, about 500, maybe a little, maybe 600, 5 to 600, okay, 500 to 600. But what happens in Acts 1? Now there's only 120, see? Because everybody's been persecuted and running and they're fearing for their, and they're scattering. Well, then that 120 moved back to 3,000 and 5,000 and then boom, boom, boom. So you've got, you can play, you, you can look for the numbers. <laughs> Paul's a wonderful addition to see those things like that. So who's sitting in the play here? Roughly about a little over 500 people. The men represent that larger group. That's my point. And he declared his truth to them. And though, and again, those that the Father gave to him. They were... Come back to Exodus 19. We were looking at this last night as we were talking about Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. <laughs> but notice, it's very... It's very fascinating to me as we've been going through Luke and now John, and then when we get done with John, we'll probably go th- do Matthew, maybe Mark, I'm not sure yet. But he'll, he'll say, I manifest thy name unto the men which thou gavest me out of the world. And you look at Exodus 19, 5 and 6. Now therefore, if you will obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant, then ye shall be a, what? Peculiar treasure unto me above all people, for all the earth is mine, and ye shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. What are they, though? They're a peculiar treasure in the earth that belongs to the Lord. He'll, over there in Pete, First Peter, so one end of the book to the other end. First Peter 2 and verse 9 he says, ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, that you should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into the marvelous light. So it's interesting when, back here in John 17, when John's going here, you, I manifested thy name to those that you gave me out of the world, because who are they? They're a peculiar people. They're a treasure to him. You think about that whole apostate nation, all the people, and he's got this little flock, 600 people, roughly, you know, five to six, whatever it is. He's got this little remnant here, and he calls them, you're, they're, my, you're, they're mine. I'll go back to John 17, verse 6. Thine they were, and thou gavest them me. The, the treasure, the, the people, the peculiar people, they belong to you, but you gave them to me, and they have kept thy word. Verse 7, Now they have known that all things whatsoever thou hast given me are of 
thee. They understand everything that I'm giving them comes from you, the Father. Now, back in chapter 16, if you look across the column there to verse 30, now are we sure that thou knowest all things and needest not that any man should ask thee. By this we believe that thou camest forth from God. That's their statement. 17.7 is an endorsement of that statement. They know. He's endorsing what they had said. So verse 8, 17.8, 4, here's, here is how they know this. This is how they can make, how, how 1630 can be an accurate and true statement. What did they do? For I have given unto them the words which thou gavest me, and they have received them, and have known surely that I came out from thee, and they have believed that thou didst send me. Now, we're going to park right here for a bit, because verse 8 is a very loaded verse. Because the mechanics of how they know the things of verse 7, he gave them, and I just cleaned my board, so he gave them the word, didn't he? And actually, he's going to give them the words. All right? They, he, I have given unto them the words, and what did they do? They received them. I before E? E I. I do it every time. They received them. Then what happened? Because they received them, then they believed them, right? And that's probably I E. Yeah, see, it's I E. So I tell you what, my English tonight wasn't very good. I've been looking at that computer and the spell check. That's what you get for a spell check. Notice the order. That's the order. The mechanics of how they know is he gave them the word, they received the word, they believed the word. So you got one, boom, boom. They know it surely. That's the order. By the way, this is the order for all of us, regardless of dispensation. The order, give the word, receive the word, believe the word. They, got sure, they know surely that it's true. Okay? Now, look back up in verse 8. I have given unto them the words. See the plurality. But at the end of verse 6, he says, and they have kept thy word. Singular. Now, we've seen this in John already. Come back to chapter 12. So, you have one is about the book, the whole unit. The word is about the book. And then the other one is about the words in the book, follow that. John 12. John chapter 12. So you've got the Word. Wrong one. That's the book, and that's the words in the book. Okay? And that's what, that's what gets to be very interesting in verse 8. Because he's, he's validating the issue of a received text. Because what did they do? They received it. Notice 12, chapter 12, John 12. Notice verse 47. <clears throat> By the way, when the book talks about itself, when the Bible, when Scripture talks about itself, it talks in this way, word and words. It's very interesting. Verse 47. And if any man hear my words and believe not, I judge him not, for I came not to judge the world, but to save the world. He that rejecteth me and receiveth not my words hath one that judgeth him. The word that I have spoken, the same shall judge him in the last day. 
at the end, out there is going to be some judgment. Now, by the way, this is the final statement of the earthly ministry, the public earthly ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ, because chapter 13, we move to the upper room, where he's just talking to, to, the, little, to the 12 apostles, and he says, you know what's going to judge you? Is the word and my words in the book. And <laughs> the word that I have spoken, the same shall judge him in the last day. The standard of judgment in the last day will be the words that the Lord Jesus Christ spoke, which you got to pay, which tells you actually quite a bit. What's going to be out there at the end? The book. It's going to be there. His word is good. So that means he's done what? Preserved his word all down through the time. Verse 49, For I have not spoken of myself, but the Father which sent me. He gave me a commandment, what I should say and what I should speak. And I know that his commandment is life everlasting, and whatsoever I speak thereof. Therefore, even as the Lord said unto me, so I speak. All that the Father has spoken, I've been speaking it, and it's his words. The words, where are they? It's important to know that. Verse 47, 48, the fact is that Scripture will appear again in the judgment of the last days. And he's recorded the words down in a book, 66 of them, hundreds of thousands of words, hundreds of thousands of verses and chapters, and they're all the Word of God, and they're going to be there in the judgment. So when you come to John 17, I don't want to just run through verse 8, because we have a pattern here. We've got the book and the words. They receive the words, they believe the words, and then they know it sure, surely of the truth. They're, they're there. Now come over to chapter 14 of John. John 14. John 14. I thought about just you know moving on down through the passage, but what did they do there in 17.8? For I have given unto them the words which thou gavest me, and they have received them. I'm hoping in 2019, Lord willing, and well, if the Lord comes back, we won't worry about it. But if he doesn't, and he tarries, then we're going to go back to doing some of our seminars. And actually, 2019 is going to be all about the Bible and Scripture. And it's going to be a long manuscript evidence type stuff and some, just some other things, very basic. Uh, I've uh, been reading and looking at things, and you can get really technical really quick, and I don't want to do that because most, most people aren't that way, and I don't need to demonstrate the fact that I can be that way with you. We just learn the information. But look at chapter 14. Look at verse 23. I say that because of that received them, the received text. That's a word we use for the King James Bible, that it was translated from the received text, or the Latin word that comes later in about 1624, which is the Texas Receptus. And I know whatever, whatever oh, the Texas Receptus, that wasn't around until 1624 or whenever it came up. And so the 1611 isn't that, well... Just because the Texas Receptus, that title wasn't used till 1624, doesn't mean the text wasn't there. Okay, you know, that's just like, anyway. Look, <laughs> look it, it gets so funny. It's interesting to read the, the, the critics. And it's just, and, it, and when you read it and you understand, when you read textual critics, they usually don't know anything about two doctrines when it's concerning the Scriptures. One is inspiration, God breathed the words, and then two is preservation. The fact that God breathed the words and inspired the words requires him, demands of him to preserve them. Because if he tells Moses, you write this in a book for a memorial forever, then what does he have to do with that? He has to preserve it. Now, I just made that simple statement, and that takes 
for some hundreds of hours to get across, and to me it shouldn't be that way. There's a simplicity that's in Christ. And, and I, I, I appreciate the men who teach, and they take their time, and they walk through every jot and tittle. I got that, and I appreciate that. But it doesn't need to be that way because most people don't function and think that way. And one of the things in Grace School of the Bible in the prep and delivery class is that you have to know your audience. So, you know, I know my audience. And we're going to keep it simple, stupid, because that's me. <laughs> huh? I'm calling me stupid, not you. <laughs> well, if the shoe fits, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> not really. But see, the thing is, is you see stuff like this. What did they do? They had the words given to them. How did he manifest the Father? How did he declare the Father to him? He gave them the words. They received the words. They believed the word, and then off they go. So look at John 14. I say all that so you can find John 14. Verse 23. Some of you are a little slow here tonight. <laughs> Jesus answered and said unto him, if a man love me, he will keep my words, and my Father will love him, and we will come unto him and make our abode with him. He that loveth me not keepeth not my sayings, but the word which ye hear is not mine, but the Father's which sent me. See how he used words and then word? The word and the words are about the commandments. Chapter 6, in verse 63, one we all know. It is the spirit that quickeneth, the flesh profiteth nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. It's the words. It's not the message, by the way. It's the words. It's the... It's the individual pieces that make up the message. It's the wording. It's the words. Look at verse 68. Then Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of what? Of eternal life. The only place that the word will give you eternal life is the words of of the Lord Jesus Christ. See, the message, I, and there's a big push every now and then about, well, it's just, you got to get the message across. Well, but the message has to have the proper words in it to be the proper message. You've all, sometimes you'll hear people say about the new Bibles, well, it contains the Word of God, but it is not the Word of God. That can be true or it can't be true. It's not the Word of God because it doesn't contain what? The words of God. You, you look at tracts. People write tracts and stuff. They, they're not the Bible, but what do they contain? Well, if they're using the King James Bible, they're using the right verses and the right words. So it, it's, it's more than just we got the right message. We have to have the right written word. We have to have the the message of the word, we, we have to have the words that make up the proper message. And again, that message has come all down through history. And it's been preserved all the way down through. So when you come back there to John 17 in verse 8, <clears throat> he's talking there about Scripture. And it's interesting that verse 8, and they have received them. And, and that issue about the received text and the words. He gave them the words. This is the 2 Timothy 2.2 2 thing. The things that thou hast heard of me and learned, commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. So you have the Father... Right? He goes to the sun. The sun goes to the twelve and the little flock. In our case, or in 2 2, you have the Lord Jesus Christ to Paul, 
to Timothy to faithful men to others. What do you have? We got the word. You receive the word. You believe the word. You've got this flow going on. The, they receive the words. Come over to Acts. Notice how this, this to me is it just, it's just phenomenal. So I'm going to share it with you. And then we'll pick up in the end of eight next time and finish up. Well, keep going. <laughs> we ain't finishing nothing. <laughs> because you've got the words and the word, you've got the, the scriptural information, but you have to do what with that? You have to receive them. Look at Acts 2.41. Here's at the end of the day. Peter's been preaching. He's been giving them the word. He's been reminding them of Joel. He's been, he's been right in with them. And look at verse 41. Then they that gladly received his word were baptized. And the same day they were added unto them about 3,000 souls. Here's Israel. What'd they do? Here's the body. They receive, they receive the word. And then what happened? They believed. And because they received the word and they believed and they were baptized and they did their program. So you're going to get the hand-me-down here. If you, you got the flow. Look, over, Come over to chapter 8 of Acts. Chapter 8. And verse 14, now when the apostles which were at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent unto them Peter and John. What did they receive? They received the word of God. When they received the word of God, you know what they did? In Acts 8, they believed it. Because Peter and John went. And when Peter and John got there, you know what they did? They baptized them. Now, if you remember Matthew 10, they weren't to go to Samaria. Well, Acts 8 is a few years down the road. Who's ready now? Samaria is now ready to receive the word. Then Philip is going to run into the Ethiopian now, the rest of the chapter, the Ethiopian, the type of the Gentile, guess what the Gentiles are? They're ready. But when you go to verse 1, And Saul was consenting unto his death, and at that time there was great persecution against the church, which was at Jerusalem, and they were all scattered abroad and throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. What's going on in, in Israel? They're not ready. They got Saul of Tarsus out there persecuting them. So what Acts 8 becomes is a indictment for the fact that when Stephen is stoned, he sees the Lord standing, so the Lord is right in standing because the Jews are rejecting it, but look at the, the world out there is ready to receive the light and the message. They received the word, they believed. Peter and John go flying over there so they could baptize them and so forth. Come over to chapter 11. By the way, in Acts 9, when the Lord appears to Saul of Tarsus on the road to Damascus, he's ready to pour out wrath and judgment, but he doesn't. He interrupts that program. So in Acts 7, Israel fell. Israel doesn't fall in Acts 9. They fall in Acts 7. They're ready for the judgment. They're done. Look at Acts 11, verse 1. And the apostles and brethren that were in Judea heard that the Gentiles had also received the word of God. What happened in Acts 10? Peter goes over to Cornelius. Who's Cornelius? He's a Gentile. By the way, that's why verse 2 says, And when Peter was come up to Jerusalem, they that were of the circumcision contended with him, saying, Thou wentest into men uncircumcised, and did eat with them, and Peter rehearsed the matter from the beginning and expounded it by order unto them, saying, and he lays it back out. Why? Because they, well, what happened to Cornelius and his house? 
they received the word, they got saved, they believed it, and they got baptized. Actually, they were they received it, believed, and, and you know, it was a mess. <laughs> it was all jumbled up for them. And baptism actually of Cornelius was a secondhand thought. They were already speaking in tongues and doing everything else. <laughs> the evidence of the Holy Ghost, they were doing it. Look over at chapter 17 of Acts. Acts 17 and verse 11. Here's Paul's ministry. These were more noble than those in Thessalonica, talking about the folks in Berea, in that they received the word with all readiness of mind and searched the Scriptures daily, whether those things were... So you see how received the word and Scriptures are now con connected? What did the folks do when Paul... They, Paul goes in, gives them the word... What do they do? They receive the Word. Scripture, the Word's written down on the page. Now, come over to 1 Thessalonians, these guys at Thessalonica now. Look at 1 Thessalonians 1. All of this is coming out, 17.8 of John shows us some, an order here that's, that's happening. They hear the words... They receive the words, they believe the words, and they're good to go. 1 Thessalonians 1, verse 6. And ye became followers of us and of the Lord, having received the word and much affliction with joy of the Holy Ghost. That goes back to Acts 17 there. What did they do? They received the word in the midst of all the affliction they received the word, chapter 2, verse 13. For this cause also thank we God without ceasing, because when ye received the word of God, which ye heard of us, ye received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God, which effectually worketh also in you that believe. They received the word, and they believed the word, and it went to work in them. Received, believed, pass it on. It's been going on that way since the Lord's day, and it's been passed down through history to us today. So when you come back to John 17, the or origin of the received text is here in the Lord's day, not on some drawing board back in the 1600s. <laughs> okay? 17.8. And again, this, this verse, it's just, it's socked in with them. For I have given unto them the words which thou gavest me, and they have received them, and have known surely that I came out from thee, and they have believed that thou didst send me. I manifested your name by giving them the word. They received the words, they believed the words, and it validated their statement of, we know that you came from the Father. So how did all that happen? Because of the Word. Now in verse 9, I pray for them. I pray not for the world, but for them which thou hast given me, for they are thine. He's going to pray for them. And when the, the way that the Father gave them to him was through the Word, through the formula. And so he's going to pray for them, and we're going to stop and pick up there because to get into this will get beyond the hour, okay? The formula here, I don't want you to miss it because that's how it works. So when you pull us today, what do we do? Well, we have Paul, and then we do this 2 Timothy 2-2 formula, okay? And we're down, you know, just insert other names. So when you begin to hear people complain about a received text, just remember the first, per the first group to receive the text was from the Lord to the Twelve. Father, to the Son, to the Twelve. 
to the little flock. Okay? All right, we'll pick up in verse number 9 next time where he prays for them, but not for the world. <laughs> that's an that's a interesting way that he says that because we've already seen where he says of judgment because the prince of this world is judged and, and back in chapter 16, and, and so he's not praying for the world. The world's on its own course. And these guys are going to have to go deal and live and be in that world in that time of judgment. And he so he says, I pray for them. I'm not praying for the world, but I'm praying for those guys, the ones that you gave me, for they are thine. And we'll look into all that next time, okay? All right. Don't forget the formula because that's how it is. That, and again, it works for them back here, and it works for us over here. By the way, this will work with the prophets as well. And that passage in Peter where the prophets searched and looked into it, and he said, and then you just write it down, it's not for you? Well, it came right down the same chute. Okay? All right. Dearly Father, we thank you for the evening, Lord. We thank you for your word. We thank you that we have your word. We thank you that we can study it, and we can come to know you through it, because that's where you've revealed yourself to us. We'll just give you the praise and the honor and the glory for that. In your name we pray. Amen.